how wonderful to have been in that team of archaeologists who came down that day in February 1906. A procession of men eager to know what lay at the end of this really atmospheric series of tunnels and chambers. What a treat to be able to see this kind of working surface. It's a direct link back into their world. The smell of this wonderful stuff, the way it was made. And this is where the gentlemen of the house would sit of an evening, drinking beer, having a chat. This isn't a funerary building. This is a building to keep life going. Carl's Book of the Dead would have been incredibly costly. This is the Great Devourer. All evil souls, their hearts were fed to this creature, consumed, and that was it, finished forever. In this part of Egypt, death was the major employer, from the men who built these wonderful funerary temples and the rock-cut tombs, to the people who embalmed the dead, who provided all the funerary equipment they would need, the little funerary figures, the artists who composed the funerary text, even the florists who put together the huge bouquets of flowers offered to the dead in their tombs. This was the major industry.
The Book of the Dead is a collection of funerary spells and texts and incantations, a kind of roadmap of the afterlife. And it was designed to allow the deceased, uh, with the help of these spells, to navigate his or her way through into the next world. If you were going to meet some dangerous demons or monsters in the underworld, you had to have powerful spells to counteract them, to diffuse their magic and to negotiate your way past them to achieve eternity. So many hours of work have gone into it. It's almost 14 metres of texts. The inks had to be prepared, the colours ground up and mixed and then applied so carefully and with such a lot of thought. It's like a little jewel box of colour. You come in from the glare and heat of the desert and the cliffs and you enter this little oasis of calm and quiet. And looking around, the colours used are sumptuous. You've got the gold background. And then as the vaulted ceiling rises up, the artist done something very clever. They've changed the palette to these blues and greens of the Egyptian landscape. The, the Nile is suggested, the sky is suggested. Very cooling, refreshing, and, and a wonderful juxtaposition of the gold, the blues and the greens. like walking into Karen Mary's sitting room. They're all here, they're all around us. This isn't a funerary building. This is a building to keep life going. Kind of like a giant generator with everything that life meant to Karen Merritt encapsulated in this tiny little room. I think it's safe to say that Dravetti's methods 
were very, very unscrupulous. He used a, a range of agents to basically ransack their way through ancient Egypt. And in doing so, he managed to acquire a stupendous series of collections of Egyptian antiquities, many of which he then sold on um, to sufficiently wealthy individuals. It shows Carr twice, both left and right, worshipping the, the archetypal gods of the dead, Osiris, and then the black jackal-headed god, Anubis. And you can see he's, he's praying to them uh, for a long and successful afterlife. And then in the register below, it's kind of like a family snapshot, if you like. You have Carr and Merritt seated in front of a huge table full of food, drink, flowers, and then on the right-hand side, with the arm raised, is their eldest son, Amenopet, and he's kind of saying his prayers to his parents. So, in effect, the next generation is wishing a long and happy afterlife full of good things. It's likely that this funerary stealer uh, was actually made during the lifetime of Carr. He would have almost certainly commissioned it, um, and would have selected which deities he wanted, the kind of whole layout, the scenario, the colours. And this was a typical thing for the ancient Egyptians to do, to commission their funerary monuments in their lifetime so they could get things just right. And then, of course, after death, um, the images represented would magically uh, continue to be effective throughout eternity. So it was kind of like good insurance for what was going to happen to them in the next world. The way they cut the tombs was they started with a slot at the ceiling and then worked out outwards, right, and then excavated downwards. Now, this, of course, is a royal tomb, but in terms of Carr's own personal tomb, how on earth would he have persuaded anyone <laughs> on their time off to have given him a hand excavating his tomb? Yeah. Well, what they did was they all helped each other, and it was barter. <clears throat> you do work in my tomb, I'll do work in your tomb. Right, so Carr, being the architect, might have designed tombs for other people in trade-off for them coming to work on his tomb. So he got the better part of the deal, really? Probably did, yes. <laughs> Don't forget, these tomb makers are the experts. That's why the tombs in the Dead on Medina are amongst the best in the world.
He could read the hieroglyphs. He knew there was an important individual called Carr, had a wife called Merritt, and he knew they had to be buried somewhere in the vicinity where the stealer uh, was discovered. They must have looked around and said, the tomb is here somewhere. Is it, is it that trench there, or where can it be? But Carl was clever, wasn't he? Carl he was, was sly. <laughs> he knew what was going to go into the tomb, so he um, wanted to, to, to hide it. I think Schiaparelli must have stood here, scratched his head, and said, Knowing where the, the stela was already in the museum in, since 1824, he must have said, where the hell is the tomb? It, 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 it's got to be near here. And it looked at the landscape, which most archaeologists do, and uh, said, I think we need to take that, that, that detritus away. They just dug for 30 days, he says, uh, until they discovered the, um, the uh, perforation in the, in the bedrock there. And then they came to a bricked wall, took that down, and then they saw the door. Wow. That must have been an amazing feeling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a sealed door. A sealed door. In an Egyptian tomb, yes. wow. It was a moment really incredible for them because all these tombs, most of these tombs, have been sacked at some point and uh, very few intact tombs. And, of course, so well furnished as this one uh, is... Well, in, in essence, really, what Scaparelli had found is the most important non-royal tomb. Yes. Probably from the whole of this period, if not the whole of Egyptian history. Yes. Because it tells us so much about reality, real lives in ancient Egypt, not just gods and pharaohs. What a moment. I think this is... This is it? I think so. This is it? Yeah. He was a clever guy. He was he a was very really clever sly. Guy. <laughs> well, that's why his tomb stayed secret for so long, because exactly. it is so unexpected. Yes. was here. <laughs> More or less. It says, discovered intact by the Italian archaeological mission in 1906. Oh, and look, they've written over the ancient red, the red ochre marks yes, yes, of, yes. of the draftsman sort of planning yeah, out the lines. Yeah. There we go. These are the red uh, ochre pigment that was applied uh, by the workers as they were constructing the tomb to give them a sense of um, the measurements and so forth, and simply whereabouts to chip away. They had to keep this as close to plan as was possible, so they'd be using their equipment to give this lovely 90-degree angle here. It was blocked up twice. Well, that sense of excitement Scaparelli and his men must have felt, because here they were, not just one intact doorway blocked, but two. <laughs> yes. Oh, it's really exciting approaching the burial chamber. And this is where, presumably... This is the door. And this is where Schiaparelli rapped on the door 
and and then turned around and said, "How about the key?" <laughs> <laughs> so he must have known that he was onto a, th a good thing after having seen a bed out here. He knew there was there was more to Something find, beyond. and this was yeah. sealed. The photographer took a photograph from there, looking in. Then he stepped in right here where I'm standing right now. He turned around and he took a photograph of everything behind. Along this wall is the coffin of Merritt. <laughs> it's all right. This place is full of yes, small bats. I know. Thank you. <laughs> Stand behind me. Okay. I'll protect you. And then that back wall, that was cars. Sarcophagus, and which was substantially larger yeah, than yeah. hers. Yeah. yeah. So very few people have been privileged to come in here, and it makes so much more sense now, knowing all the material that was originally in here, the belongings of Carr and Merritt, placed so lovingly and so carefully in here, and now displayed so beautifully in the museum in Turin. It's fantastic to be able to put all the pieces of the jigsaw together, to really get a feeling how Scaparelli must have felt coming in here in 1906. It's, it's a rare treat, it really is.
She's certainly not in the early 20s, and I would have put her more in the middle age group, so 30s, uh, possibly even 40s. Yes, I would certainly agree with that. Um, there is a good indication here of lifestyle. The fact that her joints are quite well preserved indicates that she's led rather a charmed life, so to speak. She's had a um, pretty lucky uh, existence, and uh, I would say she probably lived in the lap of luxury. There's certainly no indication there of any chronic disease which has affected her bones. There's no indication that she has perhaps been lying immobile for a, a long time because that would reflect in the density of the, of the bone structure as well. So uh, my feeling is that she, she's a, either had a very short illness or she's died suddenly, mm. uh, possibly unexpectedly. As you can see quite clearly, this white feature is in fact her brain, which has fallen down to the back of her head and wasn't removed. So what? Why is this important? Well, what it tells us is that there were other ways to preserve the brain. If you look at the angle at which the brain has fallen to the back of the skull, it appears to be on a tilt because the body, when it was draining out, was laid at a different angle, a slightly different angle, at a tilt to allow the fluids, which would have initiated decomposition to completely leave, to exit the body. What the tilapia does is to take its young into its mouth in times of danger, and when the danger has passed, to then spit them out back into the water. And when the Egyptians saw this, they saw it as a, a miraculous thing, as if it was a self-generating fish that could simply spit out its young in this way. And so, by association, the tilapia became connected directly with the goddess Hathor and fertility and rebirth.
Now, what we've got in front of us here is an absolutely superb broad collar necklace. It's the typical Egyptian necklace that you see in the tomb scenes and in the art. And it's basically made up of numerous little moulded amulets that have been made um, in these sumptuous jewel-like colours. And this is exactly the same thing that Merit still wears. Her mummy is still adorned in this beautiful broad collar, which we can see on the image of Merit here. Now, the top five rows were made up of these uh, rather elongated green beads and they are actually cosletices. Now, the lettuce was sacred to the fertility god, Min, and in wanting to be laid out in a necklace such as this, it basically associates merit with this god of fertility, of new life. You have then two more rows of what look like mini hand grenades, and they're actually bunches of grapes, these blue, shiny bunches uh, of the grapes, which not only again, look very beautiful, but produce the wine, which was something sacred to Hathor, the goddess of sex, of love, of new life, uh, the goddess who took the dead into her care. And Merit was effectively uh, dressed in a collar like this, not only to look beautiful, but to associate her with these two deities who were so intimately involved in new life, in rebirth, in eternal life. She was laid out to appear very seductive. And we know this from tomb scenes where dancers, musicians, those associated with the goddess Hathor, appear almost naked at this time. They're wearing broad collars, they're wearing huge earrings, their hair is very beautiful, and they have these gold belts with little cowrie shells and coloured elements to look very alluring, very erotic, capable of sex and of producing the next generation. So it can only be compared, perhaps, to laying out a modern woman in, in like a negligee, a vital sexual being as capable of living in the next world as she had been in this one. What we're looking at here is one of the so-called letters to the dead. And it's a, a pottery bowl. It's a piece of everyday tableware. And the amazing thing about this is it's actually inscribed in black ink um, by a woman wanting to communicate with her dead husband. And we know for a fact that the living wrote to the dead. They sent them letters on papyrus, on small uh, pieces of limestone, on an on ostraca. She says, oh, husband, you should be here helping me. 
Settle the score with him who does what's painful to me, for surely I shall triumph over anyone, dead or alive, acting against me and our daughter. It's that typical, you know, where are you now? What are you doing? What are you... Oh, you might have died, but that's not really an excuse, is it? Come on, help me. And it expresses this real belief that the dead can help the living, that they are just passed through into a, a different sphere of existence. And this woman is, is maintaining the dialogue that she would have had on Earth. Uh, she's bending her husband's ear. <laughs> now we're playing the ancient Egyptian game of Senet. It's a board game that the Egyptians absolutely loved. It dates back to at least 3000 BC and was played by kings and commoners alike. It was the ancient Egyptians version of turning on a soap opera on TV at night, putting the feet up and, and enjoying themselves. We're having a, a bit of a stab of it here, and it is quite fun, but I'm sure we don't get the complexities and the nuances that were inherent in the ancient Egyptian version, because for them, it symbolised the ultimate game of chance. To succeed at Senate meant you succeeded in life, and succeeded in the transition from this world to the next. Hence, the living played it not only at home, but also in close proximity to the tombs. <laughs> because by playing this game step by step, they were assisting the transition of their deceased relatives through all the perils and problems they might encounter in the underworld. And so it kind of was a reflection of the great unknown. To play Senate, the outcome was never sure. Would you win, or would death ultimately triumph? <laughs> you win. In terms of, a, of an age, I would have to put him uh, of greater years than, than merit, and I think uh, we're probably talking 50s onwards, I think at least, so maybe even 60s to 70s. The skeleton is of a very healthy, for his years, a specimen. We're not seeing any evidence of broken bones or chronic healing of, of fractures in the spine. Looking at the, uh, the skeleton overall and the fact that he has got um, bones which look sturdy, he hasn't got anything which indicates that he's had a chronic disease. So again, I think like his wife, he's probably uh, led a reasonably uh, healthy life up until close to when he died. This is a snake's head, the head of a cobra, beautifully rendered in carnelian, an orange stone, with the two menacing eyes of the cobra and the ridges on the body. The only people in ancient Egypt allowed to have the cobra at the forehead was the king and the queen. So I like to think that the embalmers were paying their own little tribute to Carr. They're sort of elevating Carr in death. 
He was their leader, he was their chief, he was their overseer, and the people in the village were maybe paying their own special tribute. And so he was sent off into eternity, like a mini king in his own mini kingdom. I love that. The great procession would have wended its way up this path, up towards the cliffs up there where their tomb was actually situated. Now, it's hard here today to try and get a sense of the noise, the colour, the life. That's a good word, actually, at a funeral ceremony, the life, the vivacity of all the ingredients that the ancient Egyptians brought to their funeral ceremonies because they were all there to try and get, get the, the dead to live again. Life, in some ways, was our most address rehearsal for this very moment when the funeral ceremony marked the transition between this world and the next. The dead were going to be reborn in the safety of their tombs. So it's essential, all the equipment they'd used in their lives and all the equipment that was there to give them a good send-off came with them, accompanied them into the darkness of the tomb where everything would work in tandem to revive the soul of the deceased and send them off into eternity. Now this is a really colourful, lively portrayal of a funeral procession. You can see these sort of rows of men, of servants and bearers carrying all the belongings of the deceased. You can see the bed made up with the bed linen, the headrest which acted as a pillow, just like Cara Merritt's. You've got these beautiful painted wooden boxes carrying all the personal items of the deceased. A walking stick, just like Cara's. Then you've got the chair of the deceased, just like the one that Carl would have sat on that's, that was found in his tomb. You've got all sorts of things, the jars of perfume, the flowers, the food and drink. <laughs> These are professional mourners. They were hired to make the maximum noise possible to give the deceased a great send-off because the higher the decibel level, the more important this individual was. Their plaits are dishevelled, and if you look really closely, they're crying. They're such professionals. They're crying so much, forcing themselves to produce tears that their thick black eyeliner is running. And any women that wear mascara understand the problem. You start to cry the makeup runs down your face and the, the artist, the ancient artist has portrayed this so beautifully with these sort of dots of black coming down the women's faces. Having dragged the huge black sarcophagus of Carr all the way up here on ropes, the bearers would carefully raise up Carr's black and gold anthropoid coffin to place it here, looking out exactly where I'm sitting today, as if Carr was preparing to be relaunched into the next world, if you like. It had been a very dramatic, profound moment for the family as Carr once again stood upright in front of his tomb chapel. And at this point, the son, the eldest son, Amenhotep, would have stepped forward with the special adze or chisel. He would have touched his father's mouth symbolically, like this, to reanimate his power of speech, of breathing, 
So the eyes would have been magically opened, the ears touched, so Carr could once again hear in the next world and all his senses restored. And it was vital that the sense of smell was restored. So incense, too, will be presented. The Egyptians loved to present flowers to the dead from the characteristic water lily, or the lotus, the white and blue lotus, which are often shown in tomb scenes being literally pressed against the noses of the deceased so they could inhale that fragrance. What we see in front of us here in glorious technicolor is basically the food that was found in the tomb and it's quite wonderful stuff you have the staple of your ancient egyptian life here the bread accompanied by the all-important onions and garlic and this was the standard sort of workman's packed lunch one of these on a daily basis with the garlic here that's your kind of ancient egyptian packed lunch glass of beer an ancient egyptian plowman's and we do know that in the case of the onions and the garlic, when Scaparelli and his team went into the tomb and smelt them, after three and a half thousand years, they were still as pungent as the day they'd been placed there. There were grapes, dates, and these amazing things. He had several sack loads of these, these are dom palm nuts, although I've never personally eaten one. They apparently taste like caramel. All this kind of food in the tomb of Cara Merit, set out very carefully as a kind of formal banquet for the deceased, would have allowed the very souls of Car and Merit to have enjoyed the very essence of all this food. Now this is spell 148 in the Book of the Dead, which is basically the spell for provisioning the soul of the deceased in the next world with all the food and drink that they need, as well as the desire for goose, for beef, for wine and so forth. The basis of Carr's wish list is the standard bread and beer that form the, the basis of the ancient Egyptian diet for rich and poor alike throughout the whole of ancient Egyptian culture. And in fact, the word beer does appear rather often. Here with the twisted uh, symbol, the small black one here, and then this wonderful determinative of the beer jar. But it's this repetition of the word beer, this desire of Carr to have beer to drink for eternity, if you like, an eternal supply of beer, which can be no bad thing. It's okay trying to understand ancient Egypt on a visual level. Everybody does that, pyramids, king tut, mummies. But to really get into the heads of the ancient Egyptians, you've got to walk in their footsteps. You've got to experience the senses they experienced. And one of these, a crucial one, is sound. What did it sound like to be in ancient Egypt? And this is Cara Merritt giving us an idea of that. Here we have Karen Merritt's band. 
These are the musicians playing their music to sort of lull them into eternity. And it's quite a pacey number because the lute player's legs are shown asymmetrically to give a kind of sense of movement, maybe dancing. The ancient Egyptians then, as now, loved music, loved to dance, loved to express themselves in a joyful manner. This remarkable scene is known as the weighing of the heart. It's the ultimate judgment of the dead. It shows that the deceased, their soul, has successfully negotiated all the hazards into the next world to arrive here at the ultimate hall of judgment. Now it's presided over by the goddess Mart, the goddess of truth, who's shown here with the feather of truth, which she wears as a kind of crown on her head. At the far end is the goddess Cyrus, the kind of ultimate judge of all dead souls. And he's here to watch over these proceedings because we have here, central to the scene, a typical Egyptian style balance. And here, on this pan, it's the heart of the deceased individual. And it's being weighed very carefully against this. This is the feather of Mart, which she wears on her head. It represents truth, goodness, purity. If the deceased had lived a good and blameless life, their heart would be light and free of sin. However, if they'd been naughty, bad, done anything to upset the gods, then their heart would be heavy with sin. And as such, they couldn't then pass through into a blessed afterlife, into eternity. And so the heart was literally taken up like a piece of meat and thrown to this terrifying creature here. This is the great devourer, a kind of terrible composite of lion's parts and a sort of crocodile hippo featured being with the tongue out, dribbling at the thought of a fresh heart to consume. And it's at this point that the deceased would ultimately die. This would be dying a second death, a final death, Earthly death isn't anything to be afraid of because you pass through into it simply another state of existence, if you've been good. All evil souls, their hearts were fed to this creature, consumed, and that was it, finished forever. For the Egyptians, the heart was the seat of all learning, uh, of all intelligence. And when the deceased spirit was in the presence of the gods in the next world and had to account for their actions in life, had they led a good life, they were interrogated by the gods. Sometimes 
um, there was always the danger the heart might suddenly speak up against its owner. Oh, well, they didn't lead, lead such a, a blameless life after all. And so the heavy heart scarab was a means of suppressing the heart, keeping it quiet. Um, the spell invokes, implores the heart, keep quiet, do not give false witness against me. Basically, shut it. In Carr's Book of the Dead, by far the largest section, 200 separate rows are devoted to the so-called spells of transformation, listing all the variations that Carr wanted his soul to become, all the, the many forms he could take in the afterlife. Now, a lot of these relate to birds. His soul wanted to rise up to join the gods and fly through the heavens. He wanted to be a phoenix. He wanted to be a heron. He wanted to be a great golden sparrow hawk. And yet I think for me what is most poignant is that in addition to all these various things that he could become at will, his heart's desire was simply to sit with his beloved wife Merit in a garden in a summer house. For us in the modern West, it's all too easy to see these elaborate preparations for death as completely pointless. Death is death, and that is that. And yet, and yet, having met Cara Merritt, having entered their world, I think they've really achieved a kind of immortality because three and a half thousand years later, we're still talking about them. The ancient Egyptians truly believed that to speak the name of the dead was to make them live again. And surely they do.